I'd like to call to order the uh, city council meeting for the city of Wheat Ridge, Colorado for January 10th, 2022. If you would please rise as you were able and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Thank you. Will the clerk please call the roll of the members? Ms. Hoppy. Present. Ms. Hutchinson. Present. Mr. Alwyn. Here. Ms. Haltine. Present. Mr. Stites. Here. Dr. Weaver. Here. Ms. Dozman. Here. Ms. Nasler Beck. Ms. Bell absent. Ms. Ms. Beck is absent tonight. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, seven of the eight members of council are present. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, councilors, we have no minutes in our package to approve. Uh, I will move to approval of the agenda and recognize Ms. Holtine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to pull item 1A from the consent agenda to be, sub to be discussed separately. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, with that exception, uh, we will let the uh, agenda stand as is. Okay, we're good there. Uh, we have several uh, proclamations this evening, and I'm going to go to the podium. first proclamation is a proclamation in support of National Radon Action Month, January 2020. <clears throat> Whereas radon is an invisible, odorless, radioactive gas that threatens the health of our community. And whereas radon is a leading environmental cause of cancer mortality in the United States and the eighth leading cause of cancer mortality overall. And whereas the Colorado Rocky Mountain region has been ranked no zone one by the United States Environmental Protection Agency as an area with the highest potential radon possible. And whereas any home in Wheat Ridge, Colorado may have an elevated levels of radon, even if homes in the same neighborhood do not. And whereas it is important to support recommended radon practices and policies to reduce radon exposure and protect our community's health and welfare. And whereas, testing for radon is simple and inexpensive, and when identified, radon exposure can be addressed effectively. And whereas, in adopting the 2018 International Codes on January 13, 2020, City Council adopted Appendix F of the International Residential Code requiring a minimum of passive radon mitigation in new residential construction to, to mitigate the transfer of radon gases from the soil into the home. And whereas, Jefferson County Public Health, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the American Lung Association are supporting efforts to encourage Americans to test their homes for radon reduce elevated levels of radon, and build new homes with radon-resistant features. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Wheat Ridge Mayor and the City Council formally designate January 1 through 31, 2022, as National Radon Action Month. Dated this 10th day of January, Bud Starker Mayor. And I would like to bring uh, Ken Johnstone uh, onto our screen. And he has uh, an introduction for us, I understand. Uh, Mr. Johnstone, carry on. Thank you, Mayor Starker. Uh, yes, Ken Johnstone, Director of Community Development. Pleased to have uh, Cornelia 
or Zescu, our, our new chief building official um, as of late uh, December. Uh, she's an employee of, of Charles Abbott uh, Associates, our contract uh, building inspection and plan review uh, firm, um, and has a, a, str a strong background in uh, the international codes uh, in Colorado, uh, but, but new to our organization and relatively new to Charles Abbott. So we're, we're pleased to her, have her aboard. She actually, congratulations, Cornelia, recently uh, uh, elected as president of the Colorado chapter of the International Code Council. So uh, really proud to have her as part of our organization. And uh, she's here to accept uh, the proclamation. Cornelia, do you have so, any uh, thank you for any, introductions. Any, any words for us? Yes, yes, I, I would like to um, say that I'm really proud to be part of a city who shows how important it is to safeguard the uh, public welfare and health. And I will accept the proclamation. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Orzescu. It's uh, a pleasure to have you on board with our staff and we look forward to a uh, long and fruitful working relationship with you. So thanks so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. On Tuesday, December 14th, the Colorado Parks and Rest Re Recreation Association held its annual awards ceremony. I am pleased to announce that two of the 2021 CPRA award recipients represent the city of Wheat Ridge. I'd like to introduce Parks and Recreation Director Karen O'Donnell to tell you a little more about the individuals we'd like to honor this evening. Director O'Donnell. Thank you, Mayor. Each year, the president of the CPRA Board of Directors has the opportunity to select one or more individuals or groups to honor with the President's Award. In 2021, the CPRA president recognized our very own Beth June for her ongoing leadership associated with the annual CPRA Awards Banquet. Beth serves as a recreation coordinator for youth and therapeutic programs for the city of Wheat Ridge. And she's co-hosted the awards banquet for three consecutive years, sharing her energy, positivity, and creativity. Unfortunately, Beth is not able to be recognized via Zoom this evening. She is enjoying a well-deserved vacation. So secondly, I'd like to announce the CPRA Community Champion Award recognizes an individual or organization within any Colorado community who is a true parks and recreation champion. I'm thrilled to announce that the 2021 recipient was Local Works for their contributions both individually and through partnerships with our department to provide enjoyable and memorable experiences within the Wheat Ridge community. Their efforts truly complement our work, providing wonderful opportunities for our residents to engage, socialize, and give back to the community that they love. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of Kate Cook and Jenny Snow who are with us this evening. So I don't know if either of you want to say anything or hold up your beautiful award, but thank you. See through though, so it's gonna be hard to see because <laughs> it's a really pretty glass thing. Jenny, did you wanna say anything? I just wanted to say thank you. And, and this is, it's so wonderful to be a part of this. Um, I think the one thing I'd like to just also just throw out there really quickly is we we all know I think that we have some amazing local businesses here in Wheat Ridge and um, in this particular instant instance um, when it comes to the community fridge we wouldn't have a community fridge if it weren't for Wheat Ridge poultry and meats and so I just wanted to, to give them a shout out and recognize what a what an awesome partner they are for us here in Wheat Ridge. Well, thank you very much for joining us congratulations. Uh, and on behalf of the, of the Wheat Ridge City Council, I'd like to congratulate Local Works and Beth June for their contributions to the City of Wheat Ridge, as well as Parks and Recreation's initiatives statewide. So congratulations and thank you. We have one more proclamation that wasn't listed in our, uh, in our agenda program, but it is a proclamation in support of National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. And I would like to ask uh, Officer Molly Stark to join me at the podium. Mr. 
This is a proclamation in support of National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. Recognizing Saturday, January 9th, 2022, as National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. Whereas, in 2015, Law Enforcement Appreciation Day was founded to highlight the support and appreciation of the general public for law enforcement. And, whereas by founding the National Day of Recognition, the founders hoped to draw attention to the dedication of law enforcement officers uh, who serve the public and make a difference while doing their job they love. And whereas National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day helps generate awareness of the dangers law enforcement officers face every day on the job to protect our communities and the sacrifices made by their families. And whereas, tragically last year, two officers lost their lives in the line of duty on two separate occasions, including Arvada Police Officer Gordon Beasley on March 22nd and Boulder Police Officer Eric Talley on June 21st. Both died while protecting our communities from active shooters. And whereas on December 28th, 2021, Lakewood Police Agent Ashley Ferris saved countless lives by shooting the suspect during a mass casualty event that left her critically injured. And whereas not only do professionals in law enforcement serve and protect by putting themselves in danger every day, but they safeguard life and property, provide protection against violence and disorder, and shield the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression and intimidation. Now, therefore, I, Bud Starker, mayor of the city of Wheat Ridge, Colorado, call upon all those living and working in Wheat Ridge, upon our business community, and those in service, civil, and educational organizations to join us in recognizing Law Enforcement Appreciation Day 2022 to honor the service of the women and men of the Wheat Ridge Police Department and all those across the country who serve their communities in law enforcement. Dated this 10th day of January, 2022, Bud Starker, Mayor. And I would like to present this to you and uh, ask you if you would uh, have a few words to say. Okay, we are now at our public's right to speak. The um, members of the public may speak on any matter not on the agenda for a maximum of three minutes under the public's right to speak. Uh, I have a sign-up sheet, but if you haven't signed up, you may still speak. Uh, when, uh, when I call your name, if you would um, please come to the podium and uh, uh, give us your first name and your last name. If you would please spell your last name for the record and give us your address. We will have that all for the public record. And uh, we have a couple of public hearings this evening and uh, anything else on the agenda, we will handle with the public comment at that time when the agenda item comes up. So this is for items not on the agenda. And I have a couple of people signed up to speak. Uh, our first speaker is Dan Danny Turlip. And it looks like uh, April Nowak is on deck. And if you feel comfortable to take your mask off, you may take your mask off while you're at the podium. If you'd like to take your mask off while you're speaking, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Thanks for the time. My name is Danny Turlip, uh, T-E-R-L-I-P. My address is 4704 Estes Street. Um, I believe that's all the information. Yeah. Please so continue. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm here to 
um, raise awareness about waste management in Wheat Ridge. I believe it's an issue that uh, has long been kicked around within the city, and it's time that we uh, did something about it, uh, particularly the quality of services that are provided to residents is something that I would like to highlight and like for the city council to take a look at. Um, I think we all have seen trash bins out that don't have lids on them or uh, trash blowing around, perhaps not proper animal protection. I think that's something that the council um, should really look at and the citizens of Wheat Ridge deserve uh, a little bit more um, investigation into this and uh, see what we can do to improve uh, waste management on a residential level around the city of Wheat Ridge. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, April Nowak. Thank you. April Nowak, N-O-W-A-K, 2955 Ingalls Street. I'm going to move this down a little bit. Thanks for your time. I'm also here to talk about waste management. Uh, and would like the city to take action on how waste is managed in the city. The current way of doing things with each household contracting for trash and maybe recycling is not good for the city, our water, our public health and safety, and it's expensive. Um, and it looks like we just don't care about the city. There's trash cans on the street every single day. People overfill their trash bins, and as Danny said, you know, when there's windy days, the trash is in the street. Animals could get into that. Um, trash being collected every weekday. There's more opportunity for bins to be out on the street, on the sidewalk, which is a nuisance for pedestrians, uh, for people using the street. And again, it's just a nuisance for the community. Uh, activities like the local works dumpster days and stream cleanups are really great, but they don't address the problems we have with waste management. There are too many trucks the cost of waste services is more expensive than our neighboring cities, and we don't have enough services. We need to have recycling provided by every hauler and organics and yard waste collection to be an option for people. We need to help residents reduce what waste they do create and what's going to landfills and provide resources for recycling and organics and that education. We need options for households, again, that produce less waste and for those people to get a lower rate for their trash services if they're producing less waste rather than the 96 gallon toter someone could get a 64 gallon toter those are details that are in the weeds um, i'm part of the one of the new sustainable neighborhoods of panorama park we surveyed residents in this neighborhood and waste management was one of the top issues of concern people wanted more recycling resources they wanted to uh, address hard to recycle items and understanding how to do that. People wanted composting, yard waste pickup, and a lot of people were interested in having a neighborhood trash hauler. Um, so having that as a, as a preference. The two established sustainable neighborhoods of Paramount Park and Applewood Villages currently have a preferred waste hauler. They've identified this as important to their neighborhood. Those communities have identified the outcomes for this hauler as reducing, or having a preferred hauler as reducing carbon emissions, diverting waste from landfills, reducing fees, truck traffic and noise, wear and tear on our city streets, reducing that sidewalk clutter, improving customer service, and reducing hazards for children and pedestrians in the street. Our current conditions are expensive, limited in services, potentially harmful to the environment, unsafe, for those sharing the streets. And it just looks like we don't have pride in our city with trash cans every single day. So please take action on addressing how waste is managed. Thanks. Thank you. Those are all the individuals I have signed up to speak uh, on uh, public's right to speak. If there's anyone that hasn't signed up, you may uh, still speak now. And I will ask if there's anyone online who has raised their hand. If you're online, you may raise your hand. and. Uh, and uh, ask to speak and we'll bring you into the meeting. But I don't see anyone online, I don't see anyone here. So we will close our, um, our uh, public's right to speak and we will move to uh, agenda item number one. This is our consent agenda item number one. 
we have removed uh, item number A from consideration or for a separate discussion. So I will ask Ms. Hoppe to please introduce um, the consent agenda items uh, no 1B through 1F. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Consent agenda item 1B, motion to approve quarterly payment to the Jefferson County Communications Authority for E91 call taking and police radio dispatch services not to exceed $645,743 for the year of 2022. 1C, motion to approve payment to Colorado Intergovernmental Risk Sharing Agency, SIRSA, for the year of 2022 property casualty premium in the amount of $345,569.17. 1D, motion to approve payment to Pinnacle Assurance for the year of 2022 workers' compensation premium in the amount of $282,202. Item 1E, motion to approve Wanda Singh and Sunny Garcia to the Election Commission. Thank you very Item much. Item 1F, sorry. 1F, okay, thank I, you. No, I have one more. Oh, I'm sorry. Item 1F, motion to appoint Kathy Plummer and Lindsay Bernie to the Cultural Commission to fill vacancies term ending March 2nd of the year of 2023. Now, thank you, my apologies. If we may have a motion to approve uh, consent agenda items 1B through 1F. I move to approve consent agenda items 1B through 1F. Second. There is a motion and a second by Mr. Stites. Um, uh, let's see, we are voting with, uh, with arms raised. So all those in favor of the motion, please raise your arm and let the uh, clerk stand up and count the votes. Mr. Mayor, the motion has passed unanimously, including Ms. Hutchinson on the screen. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we had pulled agenda item uh, 1A off of the uh, consent agenda for consideration. Uh, Councillor Holteen, I will go to you for this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's been requested uh, by Council Member Dozman for us to address this separately. So uh, I'll go ahead and read it in and then open it up for discussion. Um, I'd like to introduce I want to make sure I have the right thing here. Uh, I want to introduce uh, resolution number 01, 2022, a resolution designating the municipal building main entrance display cabinet is the official public notice posting location. And the Jeffco transcript is the official newspaper of general circulation for the city publications in 2022. At issue, the state statutes require that each municipality annually establish the location for posting public notices as well as the newspaper in which the notices will be published. Local government entities are also allowed to publish notices online for public meetings. These include meetings at which the adoption of any proposed policy, position, resolution, rule, regulation, or formal action occurs, or at which a majority or quorum of body is in attendance. Thank you, Ms. Dozman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to address this issue separately as a, a large portion of our population in Wheat Ridge has um, indicated that they get their news primarily from the Neighborhood Gazette, which circulates in uh, Wheat Ridge and Edgewater. Uh, and I just wanted to ask um, staff as to why we could not designate the Neighborhood Gazette as our um, official newspaper. Mr. Uh, Goff, do you want to take that? or? I can start. Yeah, I don't. Sorry, I don't have the, the statute in front of me. Um, I don't know if uh, I understand. I, I think you're right that more people probably get the Gazette than the, than the Jeffco transcript at this point. I don't know if the Gazette qualifies um, according to state statute as a legitimate newspaper. Um, we'd have to look into that. Um, but Thanks. The, the statute has sort of specific requirements to satisfy the requirements under the, uh, for the publication that's the quote of the official newspaper. Uh, I don't have that statute in my head or with me, uh, but it's easy for me to find and check. I've had to answer that question in other jurisdictions over the years, and I know there's a little bit of kind of mechanical detail that has to characteristics of that newspaper to qualify. I'm just sorry that I don't, I don't have that answer right at the top of my head. I'm happy to look. It's easy to find. Do we, is there a cost that we incur to, to publish with the, new, uh, the Jeffco transcript? There is. Um, yeah, there's a cost. I, I think our 
if I remember, annual publication budgets, not much more than 15, 20,000, um, somewhere around there. It's, it's less than 30,000, I think, is our annual publication cost. Okay, because I think, I mean, I think you and I had talked about this at one point, um, just because of the, the issue of like circulation that the Gazette only publishes once a month versus the, versus the Jeffco transcript. My only other concern is that, um, you know, I get the Gazette on my porch versus the transcript having to be subscription based. Um, and so it's not as widely circulated. So I don't know if there could be an option to um, publish notices in the Gazette as well or what that might look like. Cause I know that they recently um, went digital and update pretty regularly. Um, so I just, if there's an option, I mean, I, th I think 72% of our, of our constituents that, that answered our survey um, said that they, they get their news primarily from the Gazette if yeah. it's in a paper base, so. Yeah, you bring up a good point, Councilmember Dozman. I, I've been concerned about the the um, transcript and its its um, subscription rate. Um, and uh, but yeah, we'd have to look into that. And yeah, and the Gazette being monthly would cause an, an issue um, timeliness um, of getting things published. We we do publish in the um, Denver Post if needed if we can't meet a transcript deadline. But it's it's twice as expensive, if not more, in the Denver Post. I, I believe um, we have the option to um, do everything online, too. We don't even have to do in the, in the newspaper. Um, we, we brought that up, I think, with previous city councils. They weren't willing to go there at the time, um, but maybe things have changed enough that people are willing to go um, online as an option. But we do have an option to go online, and we don't have to publish in a, post, in a newspaper. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I had uh, Ms. Uh, Councillor Hoppe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the transcript versus the Gazette, the transcript is published weekly, is that the case? Okay. And so then if we, if we do, can, can we, we can do online in addition to posting out front and the newspaper, right? And so we could, we could also do maybe, um, is there any, like, timing-wise, would there be any way to do, like, a like a monthly listing in the Gazette rather than a weekly like we do in the transcript? Well, you, you certainly could, but um, it's going to depend upon the specific needs of that notice. You know, we've got all sorts of notice requirements, 10 days, 15 days, a week. You know, and then there's the, the notices of second reading public hearing ordinances. There's a whole raft of them, and without knowing, I think it would be dangerous to make a choice tonight without knowing the impact on all those. Clearly, you've got some choices, though. On the statute, you could, one door is, it's all now on the website, and we're done, because that's timely. Uh, you could do the website plus the transcript for notices of, with a deadline of, well, I'm making this up, deadline of less than, a deadline that matches with the, the one week publication. You could do website plus transcript for those notices plus gazette for the notices that would be uh, still be timely in putting them in the gazette. Uh, it, I think if council wants to really see what their choices are in this range, I mean those are the three doors I can think of, we'd want to kind of lay those against the categories of notice that the city puts out and I indicated there's a whole there's a number of them armed with those kind of two data sets, you could probably make a choice about how you wanted to structure uh, notices, publication notices going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, Councillor Hultine. Thank you. Uh, my, my microphone light doesn't work, so if I start talking and you can't hear me, please let me know. Um, I, uh, I have asked in the past for us to consider online. I think it's a, uh, actually reaches the most people in our city most consistently um, and we could use our communication tools that we have to proactively uh, communicate with people. So I, I would like to consider adding online and maybe, um, are we required to post a newspaper? Uh, no, we're not. The legislature has, uh, other than requirements that emanate from the charter or the code or your home rule and you, if you say on the charter or the code, you've got to do that. In terms of a, the statutory requirements, no, and increasingly, you know, the legislature just, what, two years ago now, or maybe a year, 
passed a, a statute that said we highly encourage local governments to migrate to online uh, noticing for their public meetings and other public notices. Uh, you're not required to do it yet. And again, if I'd known the question, I would have checked for tonight. But I believe that we're moving toward a point at which the legislature will make that mandatory. Now, again, you're home rule, so you mm -hmm. can you can uh, vary from that unless the courts say it's a matter of statewide concern. I don't think they will. So the answer is no, you're not required. Uh, you're highly encouraged by the legislature. And I think that's where the legislature is heading soon. Well, maybe uh, something I, I think what's important is that we have designated sources that are consistent and not variable depending on our, like, you know, variation of notice requirements depending on the case. So uh, I'd like to suggest that we um, use the, uh, the on-site notification that's listed here and to do the website notification. And, um, and then not as part of this, but could the city every month take out an ad in the Gazette telling people how they can find the notifications and for us to just be doing a general post, like actually take out an ad in the Gazette that lets our citizens know that postings can be found online and on the, the county. And excuse me, somebody's clicking something over there. I'm sorry, it's super like catchy in my ear. Um, anyway, uh, is that something that we could consider doing is actually, uh, it might, might end up saving us a little money and we could consistently have an ad in the Gazette every month letting people know that our notices are found online and on the city property. Yes, of course, that'd be easy. Um, I'd like to suggest that as a cost-effective uh, and communication-effective way for posting our notices. Um, uh, Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do know that uh, there are people in the city who do not receive the Gazette, and transcript is by subscription. There are still people who take the newspaper, want to read the word as it's written, and not everybody has a computer. You're generalizing that everybody wants to see everything on the web. And I think that's an overgeneralization. There are still people who want to read things. There's also something about having journalists. And there's also another thing that um, conflict of interest. <laughs> we have the owner of the Gazette who lives in Wheat Ridge. So, not everybody in Wheat Ridge gets a Gazette. They do not have the same information that the transcripts puts out. So I think it's okay to have two newspapers and also have the legal things that are, have always been in the transcript. Why change that? So I'm very interested in people who have journalist experience and um, I'm okay to pay for that. If you don't wanna pay for it, that's okay. But to state that everybody, most people get the Gazette, I don't know where you all live, but that is not a true thing. So, um, you know, I take the newspaper. I take the post, I take the transcript, I get the Gazette sometimes, whatever. But I read and people still read. They want the paper type of thing. And I think it's very important to see notices that are in the paper. It's different than reading it in the paper than just seeing it on, you know, website or something like that. So just to state, let's change this to the Gazette. Um, we need more information co conversation about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Hoppe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I, my suggestion would be instead of trying to craft a motion um, now um, at the table that we um, make a motion to um, postpone this to our next business meeting, giving staff an opportunity to put together a proposal now that they have can consider all of uh, the discussion that we've had around it. Mr. Goff? And if I could I maybe add to that, I think that would probably be prudent, but um, pass, I would suggest passing the resolution as is tonight because state statute does require that we, um, we uh, do that in January, um, and then we can amend it once council decides um, what direction to go. Okay. May I have a, a motion on item 1A? Yes. Uh, 
sorry. I move uh, to approve resolution number 01, 2022, a resolution designating the municipal building main entrance display cabinet as the official public notice posting location and the Jeffco transcript as the official newspaper of general circulation for the city publications in 2022. Second. We have a motion and a second by Ms. Hoppe. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand and will the clerk please tally the votes. Mr. Mayor, the motion has passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, that will uh, conclude our uh, consent agenda. Um, we will go to agenda item number two. Uh, Ms. Dozman, would you please introduce this item? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Bill number 24, 2021, an ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 12100 West 44th Avenue from Commercial 1 to Mixed Use Commercial, case number WZ-21-10. Thank at, you. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> at issue, the applicant is requesting approval of a zone change from Commercial 1 to Mixed Use Commercial for property located at 12100 West 44th Avenue. The zone change is compatible with the area and will allow a wider range of potential land uses in the future, including residential workforce housing. Thank you. This is an ordinance on second reading. It is a public hearing. It is quasi-judicial. If you, uh, I'm going to open the public hearing. If you intend to speak on this, uh, this item by the fact that you speak on this, you uh, agree to tell the truth as you understand it. Uh, so with that, I will go to uh, Mr. Goff for a staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, our senior planner, Stephanie Stevens, is here this evening. Ms. Stevens. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Stephanie Stevens, and I'm a planner in the City of Wheat Ridge Community Development Department. I'm presenting case number WZ2110, which is a request for a zone change from Commercial 1 to Mixed Use Commercial at 12100 West 44th Avenue. I would like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, the comprehensive plan, and this digital presentation. The property is within the city of Wheat Ridge. All appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met, and therefore the city council has jurisdiction to hear this case. The property is located on the southeast corner of Van Gordon Street and West 44th Avenue. West 44th Avenue is one of Wheat Ridge's main east to west arterials, and the 44th Avenue sub-area plan process is now underway. The I-70 interstate is nearby to the north, and the property currently has one access point into the site off of West 44th Avenue and two access points off of Van Gordon Street to the west. It consists of four lots, totaling about 2.8 acres in size, and it contains a Howard Johnson Hotel that was built in 1985 and is currently operating. There's a restaurant component located on the first floor of the hotel that is currently vacant. The properties along this portion of West 44th Avenue primarily contain commercial uses, including the truck stop across the street to the north. Tabor Lake borders the site to the south. The property is currently zoned C1 or commercial one and is primarily surrounded by commercial zoning and uses, with the residential and agricultural zoning and uses just south and southwest. Hotels are considered a special use in the C1 zone district. This hotel specifically is considered legally non-conforming because a special use permit was not required at the time that it was developed. Residential uses are not permitted in the C1 zone district. Therefore, a zone change is required in order to allow a conversion of the hotel to a residential use. The project aims to generate workforce housing to serve the Wheat Ridge area with potential for small scale retail or commercial along West 44th Avenue in the future. This is a view of the subject property looking south from West 44th Avenue with the majority of the parking lot out front. And, and here's a closer view the existing building. The applicant would like to reuse the existing building and convert it to residential workforce housing. The purpose of the zone change is to result in a zoning that could support the goals set forth in the city's comprehensive plan and accommodate uses that are more in line with surrounding area and market conditions. 
44th Avenue is known to have a disparate mix of uses and inconsistency, inconsistency in private property investment along the corridor. The comprehensive plan acknowledges this with goals and strategies that promote neighborhood revitalization through creative approaches, such as reusing existing structures to create new housing types as seen with the subject proposal. By way of the 44th Avenue sub-area sub planning process, the city will also be reassessing land uses to help promote revitalization and attract investment in the corridor while maintaining the character of the area. Based on the existing character and land use pat patterns along West 44th Avenue, the MUC zone district is appropriate and complementary to surrounding uses and the zoning itself supports reinvestment. The table on your screen compares the development standards of C1 and MUC zone districts. The MUC zone district and C1 zone district have similar development standards with permit permitted uses and height being the primary differences. The C1 zone district allows a wide range of commercial land uses, including office, general business, and retail and service establishments. By contrast, MUC zoning allows for residential uses, commercial uses, or a mix of the two. This property is within the 44th and Ward Urban Renewal Area, which is exempted from the city's charter's height and density limits. This means it may exceed 21 units per acre, and the MUC zone district establishes the maximum height. The design standards in MUC are stricter than for other zones, including setbacks, landscape buffers, and architecture. As a requirement of the zone change process, a neighborhood meeting was held on September 14th 2021 in a virtual Zoom meeting setting. Seven people attended the meeting and notes from the meeting are included in the staff report. No major issues were expressed regarding the proposed zoning or use. Since Wheat Ridge is not a full service city, we sent the application on referral to agencies including fire, water, and sanitation, as well as completed an internal review. We did not receive concerns or objections from outside agencies. Before the hearing, the property was posted for 15 days and late letters were sent to property owners within a 600 foot radius. And the project was posted on Wheat Ridge Speaks. No comments have been received. We used several criteria to evaluate zone change requests, which include consistency with the comprehensive plan. The property is de designated as a neighborhood commercial corridor and neighborhood buffer in the comprehensive plan. It serves, the property serves as a transition between I-70 and commercial properties along 44th to residential neighborhoods to the south. Stated goals in the comprehensive plan that support this request are to encourage neighborhood revitalization, diversify housing options, promote reinvestment in property, and to promote a mix of neighborhood supporting uses, including residential use and small scale retail use. The zone change is also supported by the goals and objectives of the 44th and Ward Urban Renewal Plan, which identifies a need for redevelopment, which would promote greater and reasonable economic utilization of the land. Ultimately, staff is recommending approval of the request for the following reasons. The zone change is compatible and will, like, will likely have positive impacts to the area. Utility infrastructure and services are adequate. Based on the char character and land use patterns in this area, MUC zone district is most compatible in terms of allowed land uses and would support the need for reinvestment along the corridor and aligns with the city's housing goals. Planning Commission recommended approval of the request on November 18th. If City Council approves this request, then a zone change is approved. That concludes my presentation. Um, also, the applicant's not planning to make a presentation, but is here for questions via Zoom and in person. So myself and them are here for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Before I go to questions from council, I'd like to open this up for uh, uh, the public to speak on this. Uh, I have no one signed up to speak on this agenda item number two. If you haven't signed up, you may still speak on this item. Please come to the podium. Uh, or if you are online and would like to speak on this, you may do so now. Are there any members of the public speaking, wishing to speak on this? I see no hands raised. Mr. Okay, thank you very much, and I see no one here in, at that, so we will uh, conclude our public's uh, uh, questioning opportunity on this, and we will go to questions from council.
before I close the public hearing, are there any questions? Ms. Uh, uh, Councillor Hutchinson. You're on mute, Ms. Hutchinson. That should be good. Am I good? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I heard about workforce housing. Can you um, elaborate on that as far as what does that mean? Um, how much is it going to be? Ms. Stevens, do you have uh, data on that? So I can bring the applicant up for this, but um, in terms of workforce housing, from, my, from what I know, and I'll let him explain as well, unless it answers your question, um, they're looking at a standard market rate for the most part, but more affordable than your usual for such as teachers, nurses, that kind of thing is the goal. Did you want to elaborate? And if you would please uh, give us your first name and last name and spell your last name and an address, please. Great, good evening, council members. My name is Mark Nemger, I'm with Planmark Design. I'm the planner and landscape architect on the project team. And the question you asked would best be answered by, I got two gentlemen here that are the actual owner developers who have done projects like this elsewhere. So if we could get either Eric or Stuart online, great. Take it away, guys, on workforce housing. Okay, if, if uh, you would please introduce yourself and give us your, uh, uh, once again, first name, last name, spell your last name, and give us an address. Want me to start, Eric, or do you want to start? I want you to go ahead and I'll add on. <clears throat> sure, my name is Stuart Sloat. The last name is S is in Sam, L-O-A-T is in Tom. <clears throat> and let's see, my address is 2211 North Corona Street, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, okay, as far as workforce housing, what we're talking about is not deed restricted housing, as people know, which is you know technically affordable housing. What we're looking to serve are the people that do not qualify for those programs, but who also can't afford you know, the $2,500 <clears throat> a month rents that are right down the street. Uh, in our two bedroom rents, let's see, we're, our studios, we're looking at uh, market rents would be around 1100, maybe $1,150 a month, up to two bedrooms of you know, a little over $1,500 a month, which I was looking at uh, the Clear Creek Crossing to give an example of other market rate stuff. Their studios are about $300 more a month than our two bedroom units. So we're looking to serve the people that you know, can't afford that, but do not qualify for affordable housing programs. Thank you. This uh, is great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank okay. you, Council. Thank you very much. Th thank you very much. Uh, uh, Councillor Weaver. Thank you so much for, for being here. I, I just have a follow-up question to that. Um, is, while I understand it won't be deed restricted, is there a way that you will be checking uh, or is that legal to ask someone if they are a teacher or um, does, does that make sense? In other words, what, what, what stops someone who who is, who is able to afford something much more than that from renting that, if that makes sense. It, it's market rate, so anybody can rent it, uh, you know, just based upon the amenities that it will have, I and mean, this is geared towards providing housing, and I think people that can afford a lot more will probably you know, be looking for a lot more. Okay. And Thank so you. there's really nothing we're within a standard, you know, fair housing practices with a professional management company that will be handling everything. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ohm. Thank you, I just have one question. Is there um, some type of access to the Clear Creek from this project? To the, uh, the trail you're talking about? Correct, to the south. I think right now there's like an informal kind of access off of Van Gordon Street that wraps around the lake, just not really a formal trail, but uh, we'd sure love to see something better back there. <laughs> So I don't know yeah, if and how that could connect, but uh, you know, we're certainly right up there against the lake and people can get to the lake, but I don't know about the trail. Thank you. Um, Ms. Dozman. Thank you. Um, so are there any plans to convert the restaurant um, to something else or what 
are there any plans in place for that right now? Sure, do you wanna take that, Eric? Yeah, sure. So yeah, our plans uh, right now in the building, you have what's currently the hotel and the rooms. That's uh, very clear that it'll be uh, moving over to apartments. Um, in the um, current restaurant area, uh, we have our architect looking at that. The plan is to convert that to some of the larger units, some of the two bedroom units and utilize that space um, really at the highest and best use. And then there's currently actually underneath the restaurant, something that's really just been used for storage for a long time, but it was kind of set up almost looks like a bar or disco. Our plan for that is to clean that out and put uh, smaller storage um, area down there that would be uh, available for the tenants, you know, as part of part of the uh, building. Uh, Councilor Holtine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm excited to see this project proposal coming forward. Um, people who who seek housing in this price point, uh, a lot of times uh, disproportionately rely on transit or uh, walking or biking for transportation. Are you going to be providing any secure on-site bike storage for your residents? Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll just speak to that. So yeah, down in that basement area, we, we will have available um, storage lockers, you know, probably five by five or what are, kind of whatever layout our architect comes out with, but it's actually a relatively large square footage there that we'll be, that we are planning on converting to storage area for the tenants. Great, and there you. is a ramp down to that storage area, so it would be pretty easy to get a bicycle back and forth in and out of there. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. It, I had a question. It looked like that you had a couple of uh, commercial pads maybe up on 44th Avenue. Have you identified potential users for those? We have not yet, but we're sure open to suggestions if any of you have them. <laughs> now we're excited to move on to that part and we've really been focusing on the multi-family you know, housing uh, part of this, but we're gonna be actively uh, looking to do something with that sooner than later. Thank you. Before I close the public hearing, are there any more questions from council? I'm going to close the public hearing and Ms. Dozman, a motion is in order. I move to approve, approve council bill number 24, 2021 an ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 12100 West 44th Avenue from Commercial 1 to Mixed Use Commercial on second reading and that it takes effect 15 days after final publication for the following reasons. One, the Planning Commission has recommended approval of the rezoning after conducting a proper public hearing. Two, the proposed rezoning has been reviewed by the Community Development Department, which has forwarded its recommendation of approval. And three, the proposed rezoning has been found to comply with the criteria for review in section 26603 of the Code of Laws. Second. second. Uh, we have a motion and a second by um, Ms. Hoppe. Is there a discussion on the motion? Ms. Uh, Councilor Holtine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just wanna thank you guys for bringing this forward. Uh, this is a much needed uh, housing market uh, in any community. I think that this gap between uh, designated affordable housing and actual affordable housing, uh, a lot of people fall in that gap and those are the people that our community depends on to thrive and function. So bringing this forward and being able to renovate an existing building is, uh, you know, just there's a lot about that aligns with the values of our community and we just really appreciate you bringing, bringing that forward and I am very much looking forward to seeing this uh, happen and, and to welcoming, uh, welcoming everybody uh, as new neighbors. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hoppe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to echo what Councilwoman Holtine has said and, and add to it that, you know, this is typically and historically been um, a troublesome property for our community. And um, so this will be uh, quite the turnaround for it and also will be serving um, members of our community that um, there's a real gap of where we're filling needs in our community. So thank you very much for bringing this project forward. Uh, Councillor Ohm. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this project forward. Um, my my uh, only comment is I hope that there's some uh, more discussion about that connectivity from this to the Clear Creek Trail because um, that is such a great amenity um, and, and I'm, I'm really excited to see this project go forward. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Dozman. Thank you. Uh, I also am very excited uh, to see the second set of workforce housing um, open in District 4 and as 
Council Member Hoppy had alluded to, um, this was one of the problem areas for District 4, and so I'm really excited to see that the property is going to be um, reused in a way that would be beneficial for the entire community. And I really thank you for your willingness to come and, and discuss um, what your potential plans are. So um, welcome to Wheat Ridge, and we're happy to have you. Thank you. If there's no more discussion on the motion, will the clerk, uh, will all those in favor of the motion please raise your hand? Will the clerk please tally the votes? Mr. Mayor, the motion has passed unanimously. Okay, we will go to agenda item number three. Uh, Councillor Holteen, would you please introduce this item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to introduce resolution number 2-2022, a resolution approving a major subdivision at 4000 to 4066 Upham Street in the residential 3R3 three zone district, case number WS2106 slash Ridgetop Village Platt at issue. The applicant is requesting approval of a major subdivision on property located at 4000 through 4066 Upham Street. The purpose of the request is to subdivide the property into 22 lots plus four tracks. The plat is required to allow each dwelling in the development to be owned separately, to establish common area tracks, and to establish the necessary utility and access easements. Thank you. This will be a resolution of the council. It is a public hearing. It is a quasi-judicial. I'm going to open the public hearing. If you, talk, if you speak on this issue, by speaking, you agree to tell the truth as you understand it in this matter. Uh, Mr. Goff, do we have a staff presentation on this item? We do. Uh, Senior Planner Scott Cutler is here this evening. Mr. Cutler. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Scott Cutler, Planner with City of Wheat Ridge Community Development Department. And this is case number WS2106, which is request for approval of a major subdivision in the R3 zone district. I'd like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the subdivision regulations, and this digital presentation. The properties within the city of Wheat Ridge, all appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met, and therefore city council has jurisdiction to hear the case. This is a 2020 aerial view of the property, which is outlined in red, and it's about 1.9 acres in size, currently contains four single family homes on almost half acre lots each, um, which are also double depth. It's located on the east side of Upham Street, midway between 38th and 44th Avenues. And there are a mix of residential uses in the area. There's a large apartment building to the north and more apartments to the west. There's also a decent amount of single family to the south, west, and north on Upham Street. And it is also nearby the 30th Avenue corridor and the west 38th Avenue apartment building is approximately a block to the southwest. Property zone residential three, as are all the surrounding properties on Upham Street in this area. And R3 allows multifamily and townhomes up to 12 units per acre. The school property to the east is zoned R2, as are all of the properties further north on Upham Street. Um, and R2 is a little bit lower density than R3. Properties further south on Upham Street towards 30th Avenue have mixed use zoning, which is reflective of the more commercial and higher density character of 38th Avenue. On December 16th, Planning Commission approved what's called a Plan Building Group Site Plan for this property, which is developed under the existing R3 standards. And then a major subdivision is required to sell each approved unit separately and to create common area tracts and utility easements. This subdivision consists of 22 lots for the 22 units and then four common area tracts. City code requires city council approval of major subdivisions, even though planning commission has approved the site plan already, which includes the architecture, landscaping, and site layout. So this is the last step in the approvals process. The developer will be responsible for conducting, uh, sorry, constructing public improvements on Upham Street, including a new five foot sidewalk, curb, gutter, and also slightly widening the street on that side. And the right-of-way dedication allows the city to fully control Upham Street and the proposed improvements. The plat also will dedicate all necessary access, utility, and drainage easements. Subdivision regulations are found in Article 4 of the Zoning Code. And a subdivision is a, re a reconfiguration of lots, tracts, or parcels for sale or development. 
creating, removing, or de defining property lines. And like I said earlier, it uh, allows the city to evaluate right of way, and it allows the city to evaluate construction documents. Subdivision plat does not affect the zoning or permitted uses on the property. It enables development permitted by R3 um, and allows the developer to sell each unit to individual buyers. The plat corresponds with the approved site plan and allows each unit to be sold separately with the property owner controlling their private yard space and building. The common areas, which includes the drive aisles and open spaces, are placed in tract to be owned and maintained by the owner's association. And tract A, which is shown in light gray on the map, uh, includes all drive aisles, sidewalks, guest parking areas, and driveways. And then tracts B, C, and D are the common open space tracts that are highlighted in green. The plot also dedicates a portion of right of way along Upham Street for the construction of public improvements. There's a large portion at the southwest area of the site, um, which will allow the city to fully control Upham Street. Um, Upham Street was actually previously on private property in this area, and with this dedication, will be fully controlled by the city. And that's all shown in red. And the plot also dedicates easements, which will allow for the distribution of utilities, such as water uh, and sanitation, to each lot. Those easements are being coordinated with the utility districts. Access easements are also dedicated across Tract A, which allows blanket access for residents, guests, and emergency vehicles throughout the development. Um, and a drainage easement between lots eight and nine will allow the conveyance of water to the off-site detention pond on the Jefferson County Schools property to the east. The applicant has worked with the school district to coordinate shared use of an existing detention facility immediately east of the site and the school district has provided written consent to this arrangement. What you're not seeing on this map is the actual shapes of the buildings, so the white lots um, also will include building, but also private yard space for each unit. We urge is not a full service city, and we sent the application on referral to outside agencies, including fire, water, and sanitation, and we also completed an internal review um, there are no remaining comments on the application, and both planning and engineering of the city have found the plat to be approvable. And then the site plan, which includes all architecture, landscaping, and site design, was approved by Planning Commission in December. Construction documents are currently under review by the engineering division, and before the hearing, the property was posted for 15 days. Letters were sent to property owners within a 600-foot radius. Um, we did not receive public comments on this application, although there were some public comments uh, for the Planning Commission portion. Ultimately, staff has concluded that the request complies with the subdivision regulations, corresponds with the approved site plan, and all agencies can serve the property. Approval of the plat will allow the development of the site as allowed under R3 to proceed. Uh, and for all of those reasons, we are recommending approval. The applicant is here um, in person if you have questions, but they don't have a separate presentation, and I'm here as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Before we go to questions from council, I will open it up to the public for a comment on this item. Uh, I have one, I, one person signed up to speak on this, uh, Raleigh Sorrentino. Uh, you uh, may come to the podium now. If you please give us your first name, last name, please spell your last name. Give us an address for the record. I'm going to ask the uh, clerk to, to uh, turn off the timing device at the podium. We will not be timing uh, public comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Raleigh Sorrentino, 4175 Teller Street, Wheat Ridge, Colorado. Uh, I have a handout for the Council members and the clerk here. Do you want to hand it over to council members. And just for the record, if you'd spell your last name, please. Sir. Uh, S is in Sam. O R R E N T I N O. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm giving that to you, and, and, I'll, and I'll read what it says. Uh, does this proposal? need modification now that we as part of the front range have seen the fi what fire can do to a community. This development would increase the risk of fire to neighborhood homes, the density, building materials, 
which I presume would be flammable, would produce a much larger bonfire than the existing buildings. And this brings up the subject of uh, sprinkler systems in, the, in those buildings. I'm not aware that uh, whether they have sprinkler systems or not for fire protection. Parking and access by large vehicles. For example, fire trucks and trash trucks need, another, need a look. The best solution would be to cut back on the number of buildings but the developer probably isn't receptive to that idea. But the, at the very least, there could be head-on street parking, which would solve the dual problem of service access and parking, which brings up the question, I don't know if you can put the drawing back up there, but on the west side, on Upham Street, is there a lane there for parking, which is off street, where cars can park parallel and uh, not protrude into the street right away. Cutting back on green space is not a solution. Given the concerns about hotter temperatures and climate change, we need to pay attention to the amount of hardscape that goes with every development. This one needs more green, especially trees, based on photos of the burned neighborhoods in Superior Homes often burn, but not the nearby trees. This was also an experience on the East Troublesome Fire. Bottom line, we need to stop building warehouses for people. We need housing that considers safety, healthy living, and appearance. This development could use help on all fronts. And I would like to reiterate the question of uh, parking along Upham Street uh, next to this project. I'm not aware that uh, the parking doesn't protrude into the street right away, therefore narrowing the access. Right now, or at least north of uh, this apartment building development on 38th and Upham, uh, going north on Upham to 44th, there's generally no cars parked on the street. It's, it's been that way for a long time because most of the houses there are, are one. Even the apartment houses have complete off-street parking. So the concern was to keep the street open for traffic that's increasing there and also the fire trucks and trash trucks that go up and down Upham Street. The other question is green space. Uh, I guess you've addressed that. But anyway, uh, that's, that's my comments for this evening. I thank you for listening. Thank you. I have no one else signed up to speak. If there's anyone here who hasn't signed up, you may uh, still speak at the podium now, or if we have anyone online that would like to speak, uh, I don't see any hands raised. I don't see anyone else here to speak, so we will close our public's right to speak. We will open it up for questions from council. Uh, Councillor Hoppy, Councillor Olms. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can you, when there was going to be a development on this property before they had worked with the um, school district, and the school district's drainage retention pond needed work, it does mention in the staff packet that they have a letter and they will be working with the school. Will they um, also still be um, upgrading that um, that detention pond, I think it was the like just the drain itself that needed work. Will they uh, will they be updating that then? I will defer that question to the applicant. They have more info on that than I do. And if you would please give us your first name, last name, please spell your last name and give us an address. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Matt Hill, H I L L. Address is 5000 Quitman Street in Denver. Um, the answer to your question is yes. The entire uh, detention, ba detention basin is, it needs work, and that's part of the reason why Jefferson County, the, the school district is so interested in us being involved. We'll more or less deconstruct it and reconstruct it and bring it all up to standards. Thank you. I appreciate you maintaining that piece um, of upgrade for our schools. 
Uh, thank you. Councillor Ohm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had one question on the, um, on the drainage easement. Um, the, is there any type of uh, like filtration or mitigation for the runoff of, um, it looks like it's probably draining from the street of the development prior to draining onto the Jeffco School property? Uh, yeah, for sure. That's, that's the intent of the detention is, is in order to capture the water, let sediment and whatnot uh, settle, the sediment settle out, and then, then the overflow be discharged at, at a really, really slow rate so that it doesn't have any erosion or any impacts to neighboring properties. Thank you. Um, Councillor Stites. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had a quick question about parking since uh, our public comment tonight uh, brought up parking. I thought I saw in here that there were two car garages for most of these units, right? Is there additional all, parking on the site as well? Yes, all of them include two car parking, two car garages, and then there is additional parking. And according to the R3, the design standards, we are actually exceeding the parking requirements um, across the board. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Holteen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so just to clarify on kind of a little bit procedurally what we're doing here, um, if, if the developer were to build these as uh, apartments and retain them, uh, would there be a need for a subdivision on this? Um, not, in, not a major subdivision, most likely. Uh, there would likely still need to be a subdivision to establish easements, but the reason we're here tonight uh, is because of the number of lots. City code requires city council to review any subdivision. I believe six lots or greater, regardless of the content. Okay. Um, so this one's way over that threshold. Okay, and then just to confirm that we're not changing the zoning or the allowable density on the property, is that correct? Correct, it's limited, R3 is limited to 12 units per acre. Okay, and um, and I think I saw to the point of parking, I was glad to see that there was some additional off-street parking that was provided. Um, and, and I think I saw mentioned in there, um, parking in the driveway, there'd be like, uh, the, the two car garages could have driveways deep enough that, that guests could park in the driveway if needed on a couple of the properties, is that correct? Yes, there are a few units that have pretty long driveways, so there's additional driveway parking for a few of those units. Okay, and then my last question is, uh, what what is the requirement for treescaping um, and greenscape on the property? I know that there's the parkland dedication fee, but um, we're, it looked pretty narrow in the front. Is there going to be any uh, trees planted in the front of the property or on the property anywhere? Yes. So um, R3 requires 30% landscaping, and this property is well over 30% landscaped. Um, there's also a 20-foot setback along Upham Street, so there will be a front yard area with um, street trees. And the city does require, um, I believe, a tree every 30 feet or 40 feet for this type of development. So there will be several new trees planted along Upham Street. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Councillor Hoppe. Thank you. I, I have uh, two questions. One of them is I, I remember that we had changed our, um, we had changed some of our uh, requirements and code to where there would have to be front facing units. Does this have front facing units on those ends that face Upham Street? Yes, it does. So all four units that are along Upham Street will actually face Upham Street with front porches um, and I guess the windows and doors all face Upham Street. Yes. Thank you. And then my other question is for um, City Attorney Dahl. Um, can you can you just just remind those that are maybe um, watching us online or, or zooming in with us the we are doing a subdivision replat and our job here is to make sure that they are meeting all the requirements for that subdivision replat. Is that correct? That's right. As contrasted, subdivision plats approval by council, review by council is contrasted, say, for example, to, <coughs> pardon me, rezoning applications, special or conditional use permit applications, which have kind of more subjective standards. For subdivision applications, the standards are pretty objective. Uh, those standards are in your code, Article 4 of Chapter 26. And so your job is to determine whether the, the plat has, is in compliance with those standards and also whether agencies can provide services to the property. 
and you'll notice that those are two of the reasons for uh, listed for approval in the recommended motion. Those are also two recommendations that the or findings really that the Planning Commission has made. So while the council still has a job to do and has to vote yes or no on this resolution, the review criteria are more objective and mechanical, and that's reflected in the motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just had a quick question for the public comment on um, accessibility of major fire machinery uh, in this. Could you just speak to that, uh, Mr. Culler, for just a moment with the, with the two entrances and things like that? Yes, so every application we receive, we refer to West Metro. Uh, West Metro happens to be less than a block from here in this case, um, but they reviewed this plan and have approved it. Um, and that includes width of the drive aisle, so 24 to 26 feet wide, allowing a large fire truck to maneuver through the site, and also the, the curves of the roadway, they've, they've been approved. Thank you, appreciate that. Before I close the public hearing, are there any other comments from council, questions from council? I'm going to close the public hearing, and uh, Councilor Hultine, a motion is in order. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I move to approve resolution number 2-2022 a resolution approving a major subdivision at 4000 through 4066 Upham Street in the residential 3R3 zone district for the following reasons. City Council has conducted a proper public hearing that meets all public notice requirements as required by section 26109 and 26407 of the Code of Laws. The requested subdivision has been reviewed by the Planning Commission, which has forwarded its recommendation of approval. The subdivision plat has been found in compliance with Article 4 of Chapter 26 of the Code of Laws, and all agencies can provide services to the property with improvements installed at the developer's expense. And with the following conditions, the applicant shall pay the required fees in lieu of parkland dedication at time of building permit, and the developer shall enter into a subdivision improvement agreement in a lot sale restriction covenant agreement with the city at the time of recordation of the subdivision plat. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second by Ms. Dozman. Is there discussion on the motion? Uh, Councilor, Hop uh, Councilor Hoppe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just would like to say that I, I appreciate that we are um, moving in a mix of uh, diverse housing in our community. This is, an, is another um, gap that we're missing. And so the two things that we've heard this evening are filling two different gaps that we have in our community. And to be able to have an inclusive and diverse community, we need to make sure that we have inclusive and diverse housing. So I look forward to this project getting done. Councilor Ohm. Um, I'd like to thank staff. I know they went through a lot of work to get to this point and, and echo Council Member Hoppy's comments. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand and will the clerk please tally the votes. Thank you very much. Okay, we will go to agenda item number four. Councillor Weaver, would you please introduce this item? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is Council Bill number 01-2022, an ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 9605 West 38th Avenue from Residential 1 or R1 to Residential 1B or R1B. This is case number WZ-21-12, at issue is the applicant is requesting the approval of a zone change from residential one to residential one B, the property located at 9605 West 38th Avenue. The zone change retains the single family character of the neighborhood and could allow the oversized subject property to accommodate two single family homes in the future. Thank you. This is a um, ordinance on first reading to set the date, time, and location for a public hearing. Uh, a motion is in order. Councilor Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to approve Council Bill number 01-2022, an ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 9605 West 38th Avenue from residential 1R1 to residential 1BR1B. On first reading, order it published. Public hearing set for Monday, February 14th, 2022 at 7 p.m. is a virtual meeting and in city council chambers 
if allowed to meet in person on that date per COVID-19 restrictions and that it take effect 15 days after publication. Second. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second by Ms. Hoppe. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand and will the clerk please tally the votes. Mr. Mayor, the motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you so much. We will go to agenda item number five. Uh, Councillor Stites, would you please introduce this item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Resolution number 03-2022, a resolution recognizing historical assets on the Lutheran Legacy Campus and supporting a good faith effort to preserve, rehabilitate, and or reuse the Blue House, Tucker Tent, and the Chapel of the Good Samaritan. At issue, on October 25th, 2021, City Council adopted the Lutheran Legacy Campus Master Plan. During that public hearing, a City Council consensus motion may, was made to move forward a resolution recognizing the public's interest in retaining the Blue House, Chapel, and Tuberculosis Tent. Thank you. This will be a resolution of the Council. It is uh, not quasi-judicial. Uh, Mr. Goff, do we have a staff presentation on this item? Mr. Johnstone, do you have anything to add? Uh, thanks, Patrick. Um, not not much here here to answer questions, but certainly this was a a, a recurring theme that we heard uh, through the Lutheran Legacy Campus Master Plan process that these uh, historic assets, the three assets that are mentioned in the resolution and have been introduced tonight, um, that there's a strong desire to uh, retain, re rehabilitate, reuse in in whatever fashion is is feasible. So. Uh, this resolution would, would set that expectation for some future owner developer of this property and, um, you know, more, the details to be worked out likely through the, uh, the rezoning process, uh, but glad to answer any questions. Uh, thank you. Before we go to questions from council, I would invite the public to speak on this agenda item number five. I have no one signed up to speak, but if you uh, are here and would like to speak, you may do so now. Uh, if you are online and would like to speak, please raise your hand or indicate so, and we will bring you into the meeting. And I don't see anybody here wishing to speak and no one online, so we will close that portion of our, uh, of our program and we'll go to questions from Council. Uh, Councilor Holtine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ken, I have a question, or I guess anyone. Um, once this is passed, how does it show up in conversations moving forward? I know it's it's a recommendation and it's non-binding, but um, as conversations move forward with uh, uh, developers interested in rezoning, how, how is this handled in those conversations? How does this um, request a council, uh, how, is it, how is it introduced and how is it taken into consideration during those conversations? Yeah, well, it would be my expectation that the, um, the property owner, SCL Lutheran, would, would, would likely you know, probably make this available as part of their um, communications to the development market as they as they market this uh, piece of real estate for sale. Um, so I, that would be my expectation. But but absent that, it certainly would be uh, communicated from from my staff that you know anyone who asked a question about you know what was the you know potential future uh, real estate options rezoning options for this property, it would be. Uh, something that we would highlight early and often um, as, as an expectation of the community uh, through adoption of this resolution should it pass. Thank you. Thank you. Is it, um, uh, Councillor Dozman. Thank you. Uh, so this is also a question for staff. Has there um, been any options explored about potentially moving the Blue House um, and the, the Tucker Tent? Um, and, and maybe if that would be feasible, what the costs would likely be um, in like the last ditch effort to save at least two of the three buildings? Yeah, I think there's, um, Ms. Dozman, there's been at least conceptual conversations in that regard. I mean, I think those structures amongst the three that are in the resolution are, are, are the most, um, you know, easily moved, um, should there be a logical, um, location for them to be moved, whether that be on site or off site. Uh, so I think those are, are, are certainly options um, for those two structures, obviously much more challenging for the, for the chapel. Uh, sorry, just a follow up on that, because um, I know that there has been some murmurs um, within the community of, of the possibility of, of if we cannot save them on the current site, 
whether the Wheat Ridge Historical Society, um, their, their plot of land on 44th and Robb would be able to house um, at minimum the Blue House and, and the Tucker Tent, since I believe those two to be the most historical, um, you know, in, in their efforts to um, rid the community of, of tuberculosis. Um, so I just, I just want to kind of put that uh, out there as far as staff and maybe if we can look at, at the feasibility of that uh, moving forward. Um, I don't know if there would be another council member that would consent to have staff look into that as, as a potential option as well. Uh, uh, so Councilor Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to clarify that we don't own this property or own these buildings, correct? Thank you. It, it, maybe to reply to Ms. Dozman's questions, I, I, I think, um, yeah, as Ken mentioned, those are definitely been conversations, and I think that's a great possibility, and it definitely could. Um, I think we'll work with any future um, owner um, um, on that and as a possibility to see if, um, if they don't want to reuse them on the site or if they can't. Um, you know, I think we would definitely, especially if you pass this resolution, um, um, last best case or option maybe it would be to move them. So um, it's, it's, it'll definitely be in the conversation. Thank you. Okay, uh, seeing no more uh, questions, um, Mr. Stites, a motion is in order. Thank you, sir. I move to approve resolution number 03-2022, a resolution recognizing historical assets on the Lutheran Legacy Campus and supporting a good faith effort to preserve, rehabilitate, and or reuse the Blue House, Tucker Tent, and the Chapel of the Good Samaritan. Second. We have a motion and a second by Ms. Dozman. Is there discussion on the motion? Uh, Councillor Hoppe. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just want to also say thank you to our former council member, Urban, who brought forward the um, consensus to bring forward this resolution um, with it being as important as to our community. Okay, uh, seeing no more uh, discussion on the motion, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand and will the uh, clerk please tally the votes. Thank you so much. Uh, the hour is almost 8.30. I'd like to stop for about a 10-minute uh, break. So we will uh, adjourn for 10 minutes and then uh, continue our meeting.
reconvene our meeting at this time. Looks like we're just, um, just kind of waiting, waiting for, oh, okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Hutchinson. We're just going to get going again. Good to see you here. Okay, let us um, move forward to agenda item number six. Ms. Dozman, would you please introduce this item? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Resolution number 04-2022, a resolution establishing the street width for 52nd Avenue from Ward Road to Tabor Street, for Tabor Street from 52nd Avenue to Ridge Road, and for Ridge Road from Tabor Street to the city boundary east of Sims Place. The street widths for 52nd Avenue, Tabor Street, and Ridge Road were designated by Council on February 25th, 2019, but construction didn't start within one year, so the street width designations must be redone in accordance with Section 520 of the City Charter. Thank you so much. This is, will be a resolution of the Council. It is a public hearing. It is not quasi-judicial. I'm going to open the public hearing. And um, Mr. Goff, do we have a staff presentation on this item? We do a brief um, explanation on this. Uh, we have Mark Westberg and Ken Johnstone both online. Okay, Mr. Westberg. I'm going to share my screen. I've got a quick little PowerPoint to show you guys. Um, if my audio starts cutting out, let me know, and I will hide my face while still sharing my screen. Do you guys see the um, screen share? We see your screen share, and we hear you. Okay, then I will proceed. Um, again, this is for the street width for 52nd Avenue, Tabor Street, and Ridge Road. This is a graphic that we've been using for a while um, that shows the work that's being done up around the Ward TOD. This is the Wheat Ridge Ward Station here. Um, these are the streets that are existing that are being improved. Um, the, stuff, the streets that are dashed are the ones that are being built developers. And then we have the linear park with this portion being built by a developer. We're going to build the pedestrian bridge and the trail um, down to the I-70 French Road. The parts we're here for tonight are 52nd Avenue from Tabor Street over to Ward Road, Tabor Street between Ridge and 52nd, and then Ridge Road between Tabor and our city boundary on the east side of that area. Street width is a, we have to go through a process um, to designate the street width that's outlined in the charter and the code and is measured from the face of the curb, the flow line of the curb, if you will. The existing widths of those streets vary with two or three lanes. They actually vary a lot um, through, the, through this, this whole project area. Um, but in general, we have two or three lanes of traffic. Um, the proposed street widths are much more consistent, especially for 52nd and for Ridge. Tabor varies a little bit, and we can, we'll talk about that in just a minute. There's a public hearing process that we follow that's in the charter um, and is outlined in the code also. Again, as mentioned in the, the opening issue statement, the street widths were designated on February 25th of 2019. Our charter has a provision that construction must convince within one year of that street width designation. And this project was delayed due to the annexation, if you'll remember, a, a couple of years ago, we were required to annex 52nd Avenue right away, the portions that were within Jefferson County. That delayed the project for a bit. Um, and then, of course, right about the time that we would have started, COVID happened, and we put um, all of these Ward TOD projects on hold to focus our efforts other places. There's no change from the widths that were designated in 2019. Again, this is just we're sort of redesignating them, if you will, because the previous designation is expired. So 52nd Avenue, starting on the west end, um, Ward Road is this, is this area over here, this very wide area here. Um, we'll be building a 35-foot wide street with two lanes of traffic and a center turn lane. Um, this particular part of the plan gets us to Vivian Street. Um, this part of Vivian is being built by Toll Brothers, and it'll connect up with our, they've got a temporary connection now. We'll build the, the permanent connection. And then continuing on to the east, we get to where Union Court takes off to the north. Again, very consistent with the 35 feet. And then we end at Tabor, or Taft Court, I'm sorry, not ending yet. Um, we get to Taft Court. Going south on Taft is the main um, route to the Wheat Ridge Ward Station. And then again, we end at Tabor Street here at the Tabor Street 52nd Avenue intersection. For Tabor Street, starting at the south end at Ridge Road, 
Um, we've got three lanes of traffic, and then we start to add on-street parking on both sides. And then we stop with the on-street parking at this location. And then the rest of it, we have to shrink this down due to some private property encroachments that are within the right-of-way right before we get to 52nd Avenue. The way the, the, way the charter section and code sections are written, um, we don't have to worry about auxiliary lanes, and we don't have to worry about some other minor changes less than 200 feet. And so the predominant street width for Tabor Street, even though it does vary, is 38 feet. For Ridge Road, again, very, very consistent, 43 feet, uh, one lane in each direction, a center, a center turn lane where we have where left turn lanes were allowed um, to get on to Swadley and Sims. And then we also have bike lanes on both sides of Ridge Road, which is why this street section is wider than what we have on Tabor Street. Um, the next steps on our project, um, pending approval of street width tonight, is um, we are wrapping up getting our final set of construction drawings put together to submit to CDOT. Um, and that is just for the two intersections at Ridge and at 50, or the 52nd for this project. Um, they are contributing $300,000 towards the improvement of that intersection. And so um, we've got a little bit of an approval and funding process to go through with them. That'll take us about three months. And then we'll go through the bidding and award phase. That'll take us from May through July. And then we hope to start construction in August, and we think the construction list will take about a year. And that would have us ending sometime in the summer of 2023. And really, that's that's all I've got tonight. It was just sort of a reminder of what we did three years ago. Um, but I think we've got some new folks since three years ago, so we wanted to do a quick presentation. This picture is a picture showing um, relatively recently of 52nd near Ward Road looking to the east, showing how much the street and the conditions on the side change. Um, so I'm just available for questions if council has any. I'll leave the PowerPoint up just in case we need to go back and refer to anything. Thank you very much. Before we go to questions from council, I want to open this up to the public. I do have one person signed up to speak, um, uh, Dennis Hatfield. <clears throat> you may, if you'd like to come to the podium and please give us your first name and last name, if you'd please spell your last name for the record and give us your address, you may continue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and the rest of the City Council. The proposal and stuff of widening our road in front of our house, which has been there for 109 years, has come under a little bit of question from us in that uh, no one has explained to us exactly how much of our property they want to take to do it. No one's made an effort to come out and, and putting lines down or anything like that. The PowerPoint that he had here doesn't give us exact measurements of where they want to take our fence and stuff to go up to the end. At the very end, you would be going through, well, they're saying they couldn't and stuff because you'd be going through our neighbor's kitchen <laughs> and stuff to put your road through there. Um, we start our property from our fence line 200 feet back. We have put a lot of money into that, had to go in front of the council here and stuff many times before to put up a fence, a sturdy fence. We've had it busted four times and stuff from traffic coming down through there. What we're trying to find out here is at what point and stuff from the end, from the your maps up there and stuff show a like a stop sign on 52nd and then back to the east across Tabor Street there at what point are they wanting to widen it out and how far are they wanting to widen it out how much of our property are they wanting to take we have lots of improvements in there with sprinklers and perennials and fruit trees and everything like that um, when we went through this process before, our neighborhood came out and big time supported us. You saw us, we packed the meetings in here and stuff when you decided to build this. At the time, everybody was up in arms about it and we talked to developers and they said, okay, we're not gonna, we're gonna build uh, townhomes here now, two stories. So everybody said, okay, if you're gonna do that, as long as you don't, force that much traffic on us and stuff here, then we'll drop our objections to it. At the time, I believe it was Larry was on the city council here and stuff, Larry Matthews. 
and at one of the last meetings we were here at, he said, well, how about and stuff, we don't have any roads that come in from the development onto Tabor Street and no parking there. And we said, you know, if that stops it and you keep the traffic down on here, we're okay with that. That didn't happen. Now we have parking all along the west side there and stuff in front of all the new townhomes, which they built up 10 feet from the road. So the only place you people have left to take and stuff is our property now. That's been there for over 100 years. If you're going to do that and stuff, at least let us know how much you want to take on it, uh, if there's going to be any reimbursement for it, if there is going to be any alternatives possibly for it. We're left kind of in the dark here. We got this uh, notice here and stuff. It sure didn't come a month ahead of time on the thing. It just got here like a week ago at the, at the earliest. We need some more time to find out what's going on with this. You have, I called in and stuff to the city planner here and stuff, and they said that we could pick up, and there would hopefully be somebody here tonight where we could pick up a protest petition form and stuff because it was not notified early enough on us to go through to a lot of our neighbors and find out, is this really what we want in our neighborhood here? Many of my own neighbors and stuff have asked me tonight to come down here in person and stuff to say, to voice our fears and stuff that once again, we probably won't be listened to at all. When we were told there was not going to be any access, any road brought in and stuff onto Tabor Street, we took that, we took the city council for their work. We have it now. There is a opening coming in and stuff. I don't know if it's 51st or, or 50th there dumping right onto our street. Our traffic has gone up immeasurably. We have withered <laughs> and stuff there a little bit because with all the fires you've seen lately, they've overbuilt every square inch of the place. If another fire starts over there, we're done. I don't mean to sound alarmist towards that and stuff, but we do have worries about it. And from what the city council had told us before, not coming through, we're worried that, you know, you're, in, you're going to come in and just take our property. We would really like to find the city planners or somebody and stuff here to tell us how much do they want to take from us there. The roads now, we've completely lost our view. It's gone. You'll never see the sun again over there. The road doesn't even melt off because the ice doesn't melt. We have water problems. Our floors have heaved up and stuff. Because of all the construction there, our well went down and stuff by four feet. Three of our neighbors don't have well water anymore. So a lot of these things were never considered at all when they pushed this through. And we'd like a little bit of please some consideration from city council here and give us some time to view what they want to do with our land over here and how much they want to take and give us the petition for protest here tonight and stuff because it says in your rules that it has to be filed tonight before the meeting's over. We're asking for these things, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I don't have anyone else uh, signed up to speak at this time, but if you haven't signed up and would like to speak, you may do so now. Yes, ma'am. You just give us your name, adjust that microphone so it's convenient for you. There you go. Better. And you just, just give us your first name and your last name and, and your address. My name is Kimberly Reed, R-E-E-D, and I live at 5170 Tabor Street, which is the property Dennis was speaking about. I've been there 33 years, and I love my home. Um, so yes, I have many of the same questions. Uh, we have suffered a lot of water damage. We're in the process of trying to decide whether we're gonna move or whether we're gonna replace the kitchen, living room, and dining room floors. All of my original red oak is gone. And I mean all of it. It's just cupped. We had water buildup. The house has been there 109 years and never had water problems until all the buildings started, and that changed. So this was, I believe, two years ago when it happened. It froze, we're on a slab. And so the water came in, it sat, it froze, and then when it thawed, it cracked and heaved the floors. 
Um, so that's huge. And yes, I have six fruit trees and my neighbors love to see us coming in August because there's tons of produce and the outside is on well. I don't know that I could afford to do the gardening and the lawn on city water if I had to convert to that. So the well is really critical to my well-being. I'm getting ready to retire and, uh, and that's my passion is gardening and fruit and all that. So um, we've just, we've absorbed hundreds of people, lots of dogs, lots of noise, loss of privacy, loss of the Western view. That corner on 52nd turning onto Tabor, they take out those pylons, there's some cement there on a regular basis because there's ice as you come to the stop sign. A lot of people just smack into the cement um, every year, many times. So it got hit again because I see that it's out into the road and the street sign is bent. So having those properties up there blocking all the sun, you know, I don't know what we can do about that. But if anyone, if Mr. Westberg could maybe answer the questions on how far it would come along. We've got 110 feet of fence there and a sprinkler system right at the edge that it would impact our house. That would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else here who would like to speak or do, if, if we have anybody online and I don't believe we do. Uh, okay, I don't see anyone else coming to speak so we will close our, our uh, public uh, comment on this item and go to questions from council. Uh, Ms. Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just two, two quick questions. So the first one is on, on the, the pro protest procedures, Mr. Dahl. It, am I Am I correct in thinking that they could write down their protest on a piece of paper and give it to you tonight? Is, is that part of, it's not an official form that they have to fill out, is it? The, the, that's correct. It just says written protest has to be submitted to city council no later than the conclusion of the public hearing. Uh, so, so that's still timely and it can be really any written form. It can be a letter, it can be a note. The, you, the charter does require that to be able to trigger the protest really just triggers a higher vote count, as you well know. So if a protest is filed that's an appropriate protest, that triggers a three-quarters vote of the entire city council. So that means it would be six votes. Um, in order to trigger that, though, the protest has to be by the owners of 20% of the property immediately adjacent or contiguous to either side of the street or 10% of the property lying within 300 feet of either side of the street. So um, one property owner uh, on this particular street uh, length is, is, I don't have the dimensions in my head, but it's quite likely not gonna trigger that charter requirement where you just have one property owner, it's not gonna be enough given the length of the street segment. And then um, my question, Mr. Westberg, is, um, since we saw this a couple of years ago, have, have we have we widened it, or is this is the exact same that we had two years ago? And and if that's the case, then maybe you do have the information where you could um, let uh, Mr. Hatfield know um, how much how much of their property, if you're familiar with that with their property on the street, how much of it might be um, encroached into. Yes, yeah, so um, this has not changed since the street was, was designated almost three years ago. Um, and we're not acquiring any right of way along Tabor Street. We are using what is existing city right of way. So um, certainly from where the edge of the asphalt is today, it may be moving, but we're, at, we're doing all of this work within the city property. So we're not actually acquiring. We acquired right of way along Ridge Road, but we didn't acquire right of way along Tabor Street or along. 52nd, all the work's being done within the existing right of way. So, I'm sorry, can I clarify that real fast? Then? Along Tabor specifically, then, we will not be going into private property. We're on city property. Yes, we're not to build the sidewalks and the street and everything is all going to be on city property. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Or? 
Yeah, yes, Mr. Goff. We do have somebody on Zoom I, from the public that I, they may not got their hand up in time, would like to have has a question. Okay. Uh, yes, if we have someone from the public uh, that we didn't recognize earlier, can we bring them into the meeting and take their comments? Uh, yes, Mr. Goff. We do have somebody on Zoom I, from the public that they may not have got their hand up in time, would like to have has a question. Okay. Uh, yes, if we have someone from the public uh, that we didn't recognize earlier, can we bring them into the meeting? I think this Take is a Channel time. 8 delay. Let's just give it a second. Um, hi. Uh, yes. can... Hi, I have, can you hear uh, me? Yes, Testarius, if you could mute your background sound, that would be great, and then we'll be able to hear you. Can, can you hear me? Perfect, thank you. <laughs> um, hi, uh, Testari 5110 Swadley Street. Uh, I just am very curious about how you decided to put these buildings 10 feet from the street, the new ones. I don't know how in the world you could possibly widen this street without taking the neighbors who have been there forever, of course, their front yards. This is, and the side yards along Ridge, this is insane. I, I haven't been here long enough to have been part of the original uh, planning but I, I'm really up in arms about this. <clears throat> Aside from not knowing there was a huge apartment building going in, but now we have the huge uh, townhouses going in and we're just gonna take everybody's yard. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm frustrated with this. Uh, thank you. Mr. Westberg, are you able to clarify kind of, uh, do we have existing uh, uh, improvements on the public right-of-way currently and and how much of that occurs on the right-of-way so the improvements that we're building along 52nd and along Tabor street both are all within existing right-of-way so we're not um it there may be grass or ground out there that the property owners maintain has been maintaining um all through the years um that's that's past the existing asphalt but um some of that is is city right-of-way it's not private property so all the improvements we're building are going to be on city right-of-way not on public property the exception to that was ridge road in order to widen ridge we did have to acquire property and we did that um, we acquired all that property back in i think 2019 um, that we needed in order to build the improvements that we've got along ridge road that are being done and those property owners were compensated both for the property and for the improvements they had within that property that mark, we acquired mark this is patrick do you know if any of the hatfield property is in city right away today well, i'm not i'm not entirely sure which one is the hatfield property i can stop sharing this screen and pull up my um my gis mapping and and get their address and punch that in real quick and we can take a look at that if that's desired 5170 Tabor. i don't know if we need to do that right now but um I think that's I, the question mark. We just want to make sure when you, you're saying everything, all the improvements are going to be done in the city right away, that doesn't mean yes. that some of these properties don't have some improvements that they've put in, yes, not on their own personal property, but they have improvements yes. that are in cities right away that may have to be taken out. Sure, that's, that's possible. And, and if there's a fence that's there in our plans, we've called out to relocate that fence to the right away line. So um, if there's an existing fence there, then then our plans call to relocate. If there's a mailbox there, our plans call to relocate that mailbox so it's you know behind the sidewalk. Um, so so our plans would call out any of those improvements that the, they may have inadvertently put in city right away. Our plans call to move those improvements, um, relocate those back to the right away line. Okay, we have uh, Miss Dozen. So if we were to have to move um, any improvements that might have been built into the city's right of way, that would be um, us incurring that cost, correct? Not not the private yes. homeowners? Okay. Yes, that would be us incurring that cost. Thank you. Okay. Is there any further uh, discussion? Um, Ms. Weaver. Well, I realize this isn't part of the notification process. Is there any way to to get those maps to those owners so they're aware of where those boundary lines are and if they do, so, so that they can have those conversations about whether there's underground assets that, that it sounds like 
the city will move back to the property line. Yeah, I'd, I'd be more than I'd be more than happy to set up a meeting with any of the property owners along here, um, either with myself or with our consultant that's doing the plans, to sit down and, and go into detail, um, review in detail with them what's happening on their property so that they know. Um, I, I'd be more than happy to do that. Could 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 you um, just maybe repeat your contact information so that anyone here can can get your number and follow yeah up with my. You? My office number is 303-235-2863. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question. Uh, Wheat Ridge became incorporated in 1969. We're dealing with some properties, many properties in Wheat Ridge that are over 100 years old. And um, so just because Wheat Ridge became incorporated in 1969, then all of a sudden everything's changed for properties that have been here for over a hundred some years. And I, I understand that. I have an abstract to 1866. That's one year after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. So just because Wheat Ridge incorporated in 1969 and they want to do all these kinds of things. People still live in older homes. And then what I'm hearing is, oh, we're just going to do take this and this because we got to do all this kind of stuff. I seriously think there would be something with history that has to involve here. But um, new rules because Wheat Ridge became a city in 1969, everything changes. So what about that with these older homes where people love and they wanna stay there, but now we're gonna make everything more modern. Mark, can you, can you address that question where when, these, when this area was um, in Jefferson County before the city incorporated in 1969. Were, were, was there a right of way um, dedicated for these roads? Yeah, I don't. I don't know, and I. I don't know this for a certainty, but I don't know that the right of way has changed here, except for the right of way that was dedicated. Certainly, the right of way on the east side of Tabor Street has not changed in the 14 years I've been here, and I doubt that it's changed since, since the city incorporated. Um, the developers on the west side of Tabor Street did dedicate right of way and are building some of the improvements that are over there. Um, as a part of their development, like we often require folks to do. Thank you, Councillor Weaver. Um, well, I very much appreciate what was said by uh, Ms. Hutchinson. I think the reality is is that almost every every property in Wheat Ridge is that way, and um, and certainly the hundred year old plus farm that I'm on has has street right of ways taken through it actually and and fences have had to be moved in the same situation so well i i do empathize with the fact that we're dealing with historical properties here um almost everyone in wheat ridge has had to deal with this kind of i've had to deal with a lot of this boundary moving um so i i do think that there is a a way to work with mr westerberg and and figure out these these property lines but i i don't think it should be we can't go back and and question at at our incorporation all of these different these different lines thanks uh, additional questions before i close the public hearing okay, i'm going to close the public hearing and miss dozeman a motion is in order I move to approve resolution number 04-2022, a resolution establishing street widths for 52nd Avenue from Ward Road to Tabor Street, for Tabor Street from 52nd Avenue to Ridge Road, and for Ridge Road from Tabor Street to the city boundary east of Sim Street. Second. second. We have a, a motion and a second by um, Ms. Hoppe. Is there discussion on the motion? Mr. Ohm. Although I wasn't here for the discussion years ago with city council, I, I support um, this. Thank you. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand and will the clerk please uh, record the votes.
Okay, thank you very much. We will go to agenda item number seven. Uh, Councillor Hutchinson, would you please introduce this item? Okay. Um, Mayor, what exactly was the count on that last vote? That vote was six to one with Councillor Hutchinson voting against. Thank you. Didn't hear it. Okay. Um, this is resolution number 05 to 2022, a resolution approving a memorandum of understanding between the city of Wheat Ridge and the Jefferson Center for Mental Health for Mental Health co-responder services. The issue is the Wee Ridge Police Department and the Jefferson Center for Mental Health, JCMH, have developed a mental health co-responder program to provide the community with a mental health case manager clinician to consult with the city's police department to act and follow up on referrals from the police and ride with patrol officers in duty to provide services to persons in community that are experiencing mental health crisis or substance use problems. The program is described in a memorandum of understanding. This resolution approves that memorandum. Thank you. This will be a resolution of the council. Um, Mr. Goff, do we have a staff presentation on this? We do. Uh, uh, Chief Murtha is online and would like to say a few words. Okay, Chief Murtha. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, just a few comments really on the on the co-responder program uh, that started in 2019 in the city of Wheat Ridge. Um, that program has expanded and it's expanded in every jurisdiction regionally. Um, as a result of that, um, we found that Golden and uh, Jefferson County, our partner, uh, wanted their own co-responder and so did we. Um, we found the need for it. Uh, we certainly have a number of people in need of the services that are provided. Uh, doing this through Jefferson uh, Center for Mental Health is certainly advantageous to the city. And moving forward, uh, this is a uh, split of costs between ourselves and, uh, um, and funding allocated uh, through, uh, through a grant to Jefferson Center that they've appropriated to us. So um, as officers move through the community and we find uh, persons in crisis or persons experiencing um, um, a need for a clinician, we certainly have one on hand and it's been uh, extremely beneficial. Uh, we look to continue to see where we can plug in uh, mental health services um, and sometimes remove ourselves from that interaction. And uh, we've, we've uh, enjoyed great success uh, on that front and we've seen great follow-up and great training from from our uh, from our mental health provider. So I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that anybody has about our mental health program. I will suggest that there are several other pilot programs in the work to expand mental health, uh, either regionally or through other avenues in Jefferson uh, County. However, we would probably always want to retain our own clinician to do the follow up and the work necessary to ensure that services and wraparound services are provided. Uh, thank you, Chief Murtha. Uh, before we go to questions from council, I will open this up for questions or uh, comments from the public. I have no one signed up to speak on this agenda item number seven. If you're here in, in, the, uh, in the room with us, you may speak, uh, come to the podium, and I will see if anyone online has their hand raised or would like to speak on this item. And we do not have anyone from the public wanting to speak on this item, so we will uh, go to questions from council. Uh, there are no questions from council, uh, pardon me. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Hutchinson. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would just, I've, he I've heard about this program through different cities and things like that. I would just like some feedback. I haven't heard it really about what the outcomes are. And, um, I would just like some follow up with that about how it's working. You know, um, I just haven't heard it. Maybe I missed it. I don't know. Chief, do we have any data or, or anecdotal uh, 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 information that, uh, that tells us how this program is going? Well, anecdotally, I can tell you that the, the um, 
co-responder works uh, in conjunction with our homeless navigator in many cases. And so you've, I think you've heard some of the successes that they've had. Uh, we certainly have um, been able to, um, to find uh, um, some outstanding outcomes out of this, but I don't have the statistics with me. I know Division Chief Lorenz is on as well, and I don't know if he has any of the st statistics with him. However, our, uh, our co-responder program, um, it would be hard to measure some of the successes. Certainly they intervene, they provide services, um, they provide, uh, you know, a, a sort of a bridge to long-term mental health care issues, and I don't know what the number is, but I'm happy to provide that um, in, the, in the future. Uh, thank you, Chief, and I'm sure it would be of interest to other council members and uh, members of our public a as we get uh, data and anecdotal uh, evidence about the, uh, the, the quality and the response that we get off of this program, because I think people are really interested in, this, uh, in the success of this program. Thank you, yeah. Council. We'll send that data out tomorrow to Council. Um, I think uh, Division Chief Lorenz was having trouble getting in, but uh, he just notified me. We, we have the data and we'll send it out. Okay. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. Uh, th thank you, Councilor Hutchinson. Any other uh, questions uh, for, for uh, the Chief on this one? Okay. Uh, seeing none, Ms. Uh, Hutchinson, can you provide us a uh, motion on this agenda item number seven? Certainly, thank you. I move to approve resolution, resolution number 05-2022, a resolution approving a memorandum of understanding between the City of Whitridge and the Jefferson Center for Mental Health for co-responder services. Second. We have a motion and a second by Mr. Stites. Do we have a discussion on the motion? Uh, Councilor uh, Hoppe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I appreciate that our police department and Jefferson Center for Mental Health is partnering in this and that it's successful enough that we need to expand it. Um, I, I do hope that we will continue to look for p potentially other ways to expand these services in our community, like with perhaps a, a mental health navigator or, or something like that that, you know, would work under our administrative services or work in conjunction with our homeless navigator. Um, but I will take any small step we can take and, and I will cherish it as a large step. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Additional discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by raising your hand and will the clerk please uh, count the votes. Mr. Mayor, the motion has passed unanimously. Thank you so much. We will go to uh, agenda item number eight. Uh, Councilor Ohm, would you please introduce this item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Motion to award a contract and approve subsequent payments of 90400 to Barry Dunn for Enterprise Resource Planning Consultant Service. At issue at City Council's direction, staff has completed a competitive bidding process to select a consultant to analyze business practices and assist with the procurement of a new Enterprise Resource Planning System. The procurement process is complete and Barry Dunn is a recommended consultant based on expertise, experience, and cost. Thank you. This will be a, resol a, a bid motion of the council. Uh, and uh, Mr. Goff, do we have a presentation on this? Uh, Ms. Sheck, you want to add anything? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Goff. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Very excited to bring this item before you this evening. As you know, um, replacing, analyzing and replacing our current enterprise resource planning um, systems multiple has been has long been a goal um, and an ERP is th that's sort of the backbone of our, our financial system um, building and permitting courts uses it it's our human resources the way we track and, and manage personnel it's all of those systems um, we're, we're very excited about this in your um, st strategic planning retreat last year you prioritized streamlining improving the, the building and uh, licensing processes for businesses. This ERP analysis was um, a, an activity to support that priority that you all consented to back in May. And in June of last year, of course, you um, approved a supplemental budget 
um, appropriation of, of $100,000 so that we could actually go out to bid knowing that we had the funding to do this work due to begin very soon here. So we've done, we've done all of that. We're here before you to tell you we have found an incredible consultant. We're very excited about them. They have lots of experience with agencies just like us. In fact, one of the members on the project team has actually worked in the current legacy system that we use today in a former role that she served in as a finance director fairly locally. So uh, we cannot wait to get this started. And uh, we, uh, I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we go to questions from council, I'd like to open it up for, to uh, comments from the public on agenda item number eight. I have no one signed up to speak on this, but if you're here and would like to speak, you may have, have an opportunity now. And if you are online, there is an opportunity to speak on this also. Just raise your hand or speak up and we'll bring you into the meeting. And I see no one here and no one online, so we will close our public comment on this item. And I will go to questions from council. Well, I don't see any questions. I'm going to make a comment that I'm really excited for you guys to have, uh, have a new backbone for our, uh, for our city. We've got a lot going on, and I think we uh, want to make sure that we keep our technology going. Thank you, so, Mayor. So, uh, Mr. Oh, may I have a motion on this item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to award a contract and approve subsequent payments to Barry Dunn in the amount of 90400 for Enterprise Resource Planning Consulting Services. Second. We have a motion and a second by uh, Mr. Stites. Is there a discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by raising your hand and will the clerk please record the votes? Mr. Mayor, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. That concludes our uh, regular agenda item. We will now go to um, City Manager's Matters, Mr. Goff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple quick things, a um, couple exciting announcements. Um, you may have seen it in the Denver Post. Uh, uh, we're getting a new tenant at the Gold Center at 26 and Kipling, uh, Legal Pete's. It's a, a Mexican uh, burrito uh, tavern, which is really good um, if you haven't been to one. So we're excited about that. Um, that's going to complement the uh, Esther's Tavern that's going on the, the West End. Um, the, the coffee shop, the um, expansion of some of the current um, businesses that are there, and the new uh, brew pub bowling alley. So very excited about uh, that new center. Um, and then we're also getting a new restaurant. Unfortunately, I can't say who it is, but um, it is a, it's confidential still, but it is something that we don't have very much in the city. So I'm excited about it, but it's going into the West End 38 apartment um, building at 38th and Upham. So that should be announced very soon. Um, then also, uh, just want to um, update City Council real quick. Um, you know, in the past we've discussed um, how we're bursting at the seams here at City Hall. Um, we are moving forward with a facilities assessment um, that was uh, as directed by City Council during the um, 2022 budget approval process, and we'll be putting that out to bid soon. Um, however, in the interim, we, we have a really great opportunity that has come upon us to lease some additional space off-site um, from one of our community partners, Foothill Re Foothills Regional Housing. Um, they recently vacated their main office building on 45th and Wadsworth several months ago, and um, we have um, toured their building, and um, staff has looked at it several times, and um, we think it will meet our needs for a tem on a temporary basis. So we are currently negotiating a lease with them, which we'll bring back to City Council here soon for, for final discussion on, on that. Um, but with that, I am, that's it. Thanks, Mayor. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, City Attorney's Matters, Mr. Dahl. Nothing tonight. Thank you. No, good and brief. Thank you. Um, elected Officials Matters, we'll uh, start with Ms. Dozman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to announce that the Wheat Ridge Grange is having their fifth annual green and red chili dinner on Thursday, January 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, but the sign up is uh, by January 15th of 2022. Usually this is kind of like a chili cook off, but this year they're just uh, having everybody bring their chili and swapping recipes. Um, it's always a really fun event that I take the kiddos to um, and everybody brings out really good recipes. So I've encouraged some of my family to join and uh, I hope to see others there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ohm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Um, first, I'd like to give a big thank you to Vanola's. Um, I've been taking my kids there. It's close to my neighborhood over the many, many years. And for those who haven't uh, been there, um, it's some pretty amazing food. Um, so I, I'm really appreciative that it's so close to my neighborhood. The other thing is I've noticed uh, um, going through the construction on Wadsworth, uh, the city and the consultants have done a great job. I've thought about trying to, you know, go around it and try to make my life easier, but um, it's it's been actually pretty easy in different times of the day, not just, um, you know, after five o'clock. And so, you know, uh, a big thank you for that. I've also noticed um, traffic uh, radar trailers moving throughout my neighborhood, which I assume is probably for data collection for prior to the Wadsworth construction, um, which was, uh, you know, a discussion that, uh, we had with uh, the city manager and council member Hotine with uh, consultants. So thank you to them too. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson, I'm gonna go to you before I, before I forget to look at my screen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've just made an observation regarding Wheat Ridge Speaks, um, people who listen online and also people who may come into city council with comments and it may be an indication of our climate of how everything is out there but um it's just something that i've noticed where the public isn't as attached as they were before and i hope that um we all get better with all of this and just uh, take care of yourself and be safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Councillor Stites. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Want to welcome the Legal Peets to District 3. We're excited to have them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, we had a couple of snows last week, and, and I had a, several neighbors out uh, helping take care of their other neighbors and elderly neighbors. So I wanted to thank all of our neighbors and, and make sure that. Uh, Businesses, especially as, as the snow does come, it really does look terrible as, as a business owner when people are needing to go into the street or especially watching wheelchairs go into the street um, to avoid our snowy sidewalks. So uh, get out there and uh, take care of your neighbors. And if you can find it, find it and buy a Wheat Ridge. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just um, wanted to uh, thank the city for such great snow dealings I uh, just really appreciate that and I also want to remind everybody it's stock show time so if you don't have anything to do this week and next week it's a lot of fun thank you councillor Hoppy thanks mr. mayor uh, I was under the impression that under city managers matters we were going to discuss if we were going to go virtual so I just, we're all sitting here, I'm like, when is this coming up? <laughs> yep, that's all I needed. <laughs> okay. Mayor Pro Tem Holteen. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I do have a few things to bring up. Um, <laughs> Uh, surprise, uh, I'd like to uh, discuss again this week um, the prospect of going virtual uh, for a short run while this surge passes. Um, we have increasing concerns uh, amongst our peers and amongst staff around minimizing exposure um, from this very uh, transmissible version of COVID that's in our community right now. Um, there are people that we serve with and city staff members who support us who have household members who are vulnerable and um, some of them not eligible for vaccination. So I would like uh, us to consider going virtual. Um, I mean, we don't have a meeting next week. So we only have, do we have two more meetings this month? And or no, we only have one more meeting this month um, and kind of a light schedule in February. Um, so I would like to propose uh, at least th through the end of February that we consider going virtual um, for, you know, just as Patrick exp expressed in the email that you guys got, um, staff is really being impacted and uh, everyone's just trying to minimize exposure. And um, COVID is, is amongst us and there are some concerns. So I'd like to get feedback from you guys um, about going virtual. 
not for the long term, just for the short term while this, uh, this particular wave passes. Uh, Councillor Hoppe. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I just wanted to clarify, would that be a return date of February 28th, or will, you, will the consensus that you'll be asking for be a return date of the 28th, or will it be a return date of uh, March 7th, which is our first meeting in March? I would suggest uh, we do March 7th. Um, I tend to be a fan of calendars <laughs> just through February to make it easy. Um, and that we have enough advanced planning. Um, that way, if we get into February, or into February and realize things aren't improving, we can make a decision then. So I'd like to propose uh, we stay virtual through the 28th of February, proposing returning back on the 7th unless uh, we as a body decide otherwise. Okay, so we're, uh, there's going to be a consensus. Uh, <clears throat> so before we go to the consensus, let's see if we have any discussion around it. Mr. Ohm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think what uh, Patrick had sent the email that discussed um, was helpful, uh, at, you know, to kind of shed some light on what, what the city staff is going through and, uh, and also what Chief Martha had sent something that kind of talked about COVID. Uh, you know, I can, I can tell you today, it's like, how does it affect me personally? I, I got a nephew that has it today. I have, um, my kids have been dodging a few bullets uh, with people that have had it. Um, so it's, it's pretty close to home. It's getting a little, it's getting a little hot, so. I would be supportive of doing that. Additional discussion? Um, Ms. Hoppe? Yeah, I'm, I'm in support of, uh, of us going um, virtual until March 7th. It, you know, from a lot of the, the projected data out there about where we're gonna end, where we'll potentially end up with as, as they're reading the science and stuff is that we're gonna potentially end on a peak at the end of January, beginning of February-ish. That'll get us a couple of weeks outside of the peak. And um, uh, although I much prefer our meetings in person, and I very much prefer being able to have people who are in chambers in person, um, it is important that we are protecting our staff. It's important that we're protecting our, our police department, and it's important that we're protecting our colleagues who have younger children who not yet have had the opportunity to be able to get unvaccinated and so i would be in support of it okay additional discussion okay let's see a show of hand oh miss hutchinson that's why i'm here tonight i totally support this um we have uh conventions that are going on in town stock show the garden and home show is going to be going on this is something that is going on and, and increasing daily, and we need to be smart about it. And um, I just think safety first, and I totally support it. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so we're looking for a consensus vote to, uh, to uh, go uh, by remote until uh, March the 7th. May I see a show of hands in favor of that? Proposition. Okay, we have consensus on that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do have a couple of other things. Um, we heard from a couple of members of the public tonight uh, asking City Council to take a look at what uh, our different policies currently are and could be around uh, waste management in the city. And so I would like to add that to our list of study sessions if I would have a second from another City Council member. I'll support you. Okay. All right, great, thank you. Um, yep, all right, thank you very much. Uh, and then I want Can to- Can I ask one thing on that real quick, Ms. Holtine? Um, yes. <clears throat> I had a couple of constituents uh, reach out a couple of months ago about um, how long trash can be left out on the curb. Currently, we don't have any um, uh, ordinances about that. Is that something that could be included in that as well? Or is that something- that Yeah, I think that would be part of the whole holistic discussion. Yeah, great, thank you. We had the holistic trash discussion. We were, we were adopt a holistic uh, trash policy. Um, 
so then my third thing, uh, we are recognizing uh, radon awareness. I have an uncle who um, is in end stage lung cancer from radon in his house. And so it is close to my family and I think incredibly important. Um, if you go to the CDPHE, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, uh, they no longer offer free, but they offer very low cost in-home radon testing, all-inclusive at $17 for a short-term test, $27 for a long-term test. And I encourage everyone, if you do not know the radon level in your house, you should get it tested. Um, it is very serious. It is invisible, and you do not want to find out when it's too late that you have it. So... Um, ending on a lighter note, I don't even know the name of the new restaurant that opened up at 44th and like Yarrow in the old 44th Avenue Lounge. And it's just the most amazing Indian food that is doing takeout. And I just highly encourage someone to find out what they're called and uh, to go get some really delicious, really high, hot and spicy, good in, in January Indian food takeout. Um, and I will maybe next time know the name of it. it. They don't have a sign up, but it's delicious. So I highly recommend it. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I had a request from, from uh, Councillor uh, Nossler Beck uh, asked me to read this uh, tribute to an exemplary Wheat Ridge uh, resident this evening. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to honor an exemplary Wheat Ridge resident, Coach Merle Shirley. Merle resided in Wheat Ridge for nearly 70 years and at the time uh, uh, and in that time, put young people in this community first. Merle knew that young men uh, he coached basketball and football were the future business owners, educators, fathers, and leaders of our community. Uh, Merle invested his time and coaching ex expertise for 46 years, coaching youth Wheat Ridge baseball or basketball, oh, uh, and for over 40 years, he coached Wheat Ridge youth football. He was part of the Wheat Ridge Optimist. Uh, for more than 30 years, and last year's Carnation Parade was uh, honored to ride with the Optimus Carnation Day float. When not coaching, he was a loving father to uh, 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 Carol and Brett and his three grand uh, grandchildren. Um, <clears throat> Merle, um, excuse me, uh, Merle will be missed by so many because he has touched, uh, touched so many. Beyond young men, he coached. Uh, he also monitored and trained uh, uh, me uh, mentored and trained former players to be great coaches. Moore would show up for his players and coaches wherever he was, wherever they were playing. Uh, players could recognize Merle in the stands, uh, cheering for them on with a per perfectly co coiffed mustache and goatee. Uh, he knew that not everyone was going to be a great player, but that everyone needed to be part of the team. Um, because of Merle's uh, dedicated uh, uh, a excuse me, decades of dedication to the young people in Wheat Ridge, Merle's legacy continues on. So in honor of Coach Merle Stanley, when you see a Wheat Ridge youth um, and their coaches out on the playing soccer, softball, baseball, football, swimming, or playing basketball, um, thank that coach and all they do for our Wheat Ridge community, and thank you, Coach Merle Shirley, for being a part of our city. Um, I want to, uh, I had... Uh, I had a virtual uh, a coffee with the mayor last Saturday. I want to thank all the all the folks that attended, and and it was a good meeting. Even even virtually, we uh, we all talked about how we'd rather be in person, but we'd rather be safe safe than uh, in, than in person. So thanks to those folks. Um, the Wheat Ridge Business District. I attended their meeting last uh, last week um, with uh, with Councillor um, Stites. Um, we have an opening uh, from council for a council. Uh, uh, appointment to that uh, to that board. I sit on that council. Uh, uh, Mr. Stites sits on that council. I would like uh, to make a motion or a suggestion that we uh, that we uh, approve uh, Councilwoman uh, Weaver to um, to be a member of that board. So, if there is, uh, I would take discussion on that. But I would like to put forward that nomination and uh, and see if we can approve that by uh, acclamation. Uh, Councillor Hoppy. Uh, I'm sorry, Mayor. Were you just were you asking for a motion to move that forward, or? I want I, I want a consensus that we move. Uh, I'd Weaver like to ask for a consensus to appoint Councilwoman Weaver to the Wheat Ridge Business District Board. 
Okay, we have consensus, so, uh, so we're going to uh, point you to that board, and I will uh, let the board know that. Ms. Weaver, thank you for agreeing to uh, participate in that, um, that forum. It's, a, it's, a very, uh, it's interesting and it's valuable to our city. So, I don't believe there's uh, yes, Ms. Uh, Hoppy. Or Miss Saltine, excuse me. Uh, I did find the name of that restaurant. It's uh, Babari. So, uh, I, yeah, Babari at 44th and Yarrow, kind of in the um, where uh, Walgreens is, like just west of Walgreens. So. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any more business to come before our council? If not, we will stand adjourned, drive safely, and we will see you back here, not next week, but the following week. Not here, online. <laughs>